that 20 years ago, basically, when we talked about interpreting, we talked about international conference interpreting. Didn't really need to define what we meant. Interpreting was professional uh, international conference interpreting, and we all know that now we've moved from the international sphere also towards institutional settings in the community, and <clears throat> we're not only looking at conference discourse, but dialogic interactions. That's happened, and that's had implications in terms of the various features of our object of study that have played a role. This is just a, a rough uh, indication of the things that are classical in our field. We look at the simultaneous mode, international settings, uh, international conference languages, uh, professional trained interpreters, and so on and so forth. And we know that since the 1980s, roughly, we've shifted towards other settings, including sign language interpreting and so on. And this has been extended to fields uh, that are even further out in the community with um, uh, migrant languages, exotic languages, as we call them in our systems, as exotic as Chinese, for instance. Chinese is an exotic language in Austria when we discuss policies and training. Uh, but here is the first issue that links up with what we heard yesterday. We have, for instance, as part of this new domain that we are increasingly uh, taking seriously non-professional interpreting. And yesterday we heard, come on, it's fan subbing, for instance. It's happening, it's out there, let it, you know, accept it, and we can do research on it. This, in interpreting, has some interesting ethical implications. Because if you say children, bilingual children, and we talked about it, Claudia, on the way up here, are doing interpreting in institutional settings, in schools, in healthcare centers, should we just say, hey, non-professional interpreting, it's interesting, let's study it, but leave it alone. Hmm? Yes, that's what we're doing, that's what we should be doing, but this practice has some, some implications in terms of uh, rights and, uh, yeah, who, who has access to services, who has access to interpreting services. Okay, so then the issue of non-professional interpreting is there, but with a, with a special twist because it links up with uh, linguistic rights issues in society. Uh, traditionally, on a problem-oriented basis, cognitive issues, and we've seen a shift towards the more social, ethics, role issues, or also the concern with quality, I think has been extended or should be extended. That's another top problem that I would like to suggest towards not only assessing quality, but investigating how effective our interpreting services, how well do they work, what's the communicative effect of various uh, interpreting arrangements. So that's one uh, domain. Another domain where things have been broadening, new things developing, has technology. It's not listed explicitly here, but if we look at the various modes of interpreting, there are new modes developing because new technologies have become available. For instance, uh, this uh, interesting little topic that's called uh, simultaneous consecutive interpreting. Rather than taking notes in the consecutive mode, you record the original on a digital voice recorder, play back what you've taped, and do a simultaneous rendering of the original speech. It's, for the audience, it's consecutive because it's after the original speech, but it's actually performed in the simultaneous mode. An interesting technology-based hybrid form that really has only been studied in a few initial projects. Or the role of technology in remote interpreting. For about 10 years, uh, there's been remote simultaneous interpreting in medical settings. It's been going on for several years. We haven't heard much about it. One or two papers published. There's a lot to be done because new technology has made new forms of interpretation possible. Interpretation. Interpreting uh, possible. Uh, that, that our, our domain of study has, has extended. So technology really is integral to some of these developments, also in our field. In terms of the ideas, you might have seen this map. We know that there are some dominant ideas that we've had in our field. And I remember five years ago in Prague, Anthony said, well, this is all nice and well, but uh, isn't it more interesting to know about the ideas that we don't have, rather than saying the ideas that we have been having in our discourse? So what are the ideas that, that should be developed, what are the, uh, what, what is missing in this scheme? I still have a very, co I don't have a coherent answer, but I think that the, uh, we need more ideas about the 
a cognitive view of interaction. There is a split between either cognitive or interaction studies, and obviously when you interact, it's a cognitively based process. So to bring these two together, I think it was mentioned in one of the round tables. It would be fascinating to link up the cognitive outlook with the, the sociologic interaction analytical outlook. So there's new ideas needed here also in terms of the cultural implications, new ideas needed, especially focusing on cultural ways of, of uh, producing and receiving discourse, maybe even linking up cultural implications of, of, co of cognitive things. So, you know, give you that, there's a, there's a lot missing. We have a few ideas out there, but we need to extend the map of ideas about uh, interpreting. Also extend the modeling dimensions. We have very much focused on cognitive models. There is Moza Mercer and Gerver and Gilles and Mizuno and, and all these people who've, who've developed models of the cognitive process of interpreting. Uh, some people focusing on simultaneous interpreting, others uh, extending the modeling effort also to other forms of interpreting, including sight interpreting, uh, which came up as another interesting hybrid form yesterday. But I think extending uh, the, the modeling effort also means we need to develop better models for the, the interaction, the institutional dimension, or uh, as Michaela would say, the, the status of, uh, of translation in society at the macro-social level, we need some models, Bourdieu for instance, but not exclusively, to deal with, with this much broader look at interpreting that, that more and more people are adopting. And this is really where the broader moves into the better, because I'm not sure in our little discipline that we have all the ideas and models needed, or that we have already <laughs> cultivated them, in order to study interpreting at these broader social dimensions. So better models and theories are needed. I'll just give one classic example of how we have become better in terms of developing better models starting with a classic model by Seleskovich. Many people still subscribe to that, including myself, that interpreting is not transcoding, but it's a sense-based process. But that's a model dating back to the 1960s, and can we really afford to, to use that as our foundation? And it has been extended and developed, for instance, by, by Robin Seton, whose model is eclectic, uh, so cognitive scientific model of the process, I think, ties in with this triangular structure, but has drawn on all these insights from psycholinguistics, uh, cognitive science, in order to better describe language comprehension, language production in, in simultaneous interpreting. So we're, we're developing along the right lines, better models, at least also in the cognitive field. I'm still not sure we've done a lot of uh, work in, in the sociological orientation. Maura Ingileri's work was mentioned uh, to study the status of interpreters working in asylum hearings in Great Britain. Those are, uh, that, that's work going in that direction. But we probably need a lot more of that. Uh, moving, this is very sophisticated, moving, go, moving on to better methods on a very modest scale. And please don't laugh at me. We need better methods. I'll give you one example of a recent PhD thesis, and this is a little excerpt from the questionnaire used to conduct a survey on healthcare interpreting. One question was about the age group. This was addressed to interpreters, but also to healthcare staff. And these were the response options. Second question, how long have you been working as a doctor with these response options? We don't have time to really discuss a lot of that, but I'm not sure I would suggest these response options as a model for students to adopt when they, when they uh, design a questionnaire. And the problem is they're not asking their friends or their classmates. This is really trying to access other professions so our research or the quality of our questionnaires reflects on the status and sophistication of our discipline. And I think uh, 
apart from the fact that we could do better thinking of what do we want these people to respond and what if you have been in the profession for five years, which option do you, do you pick if it's two to five and five to eight, right? Simple little things. Uh, what do you do with the data? You have all these ranges and then how can you work uh, on the data trying to establish correlations where the working experience makes a difference if you have all these brackets and percentages of people falling into the various uh, age ranges. So a very simple example, but it really reflects where we're at in, in terms of con using social science methods at the PhD level, mind you. Mm -hmm. this, this is, I think this can be developed, this can be improved uh, to do these, these, yeah, very accessible approaches, asking doctors questions about their work and using interpreters. Okay, so better methods, which, another example, there's this classic, often cited study by Hildegund Bühler. This is the original questionnaire, 1985, probably distributed among conference interpreters. 16 criteria about the quality of interpretation and interpreters. This was used, as we know, by Ingrid Kurz in a shortened version. This was her original questionnaire, uh, eight criteria, and please fill in this questionnaire. This, yes, but we have never found out anything about the sample, for instance. Who were these people who filled in the questionnaire? Uh, neither Bühler nor Kurz ever elicited any demographic variables. So this was pioneering work. I'm just saying that if we ask students to do similar work, we need to encourage them to, to, to do better, to go beyond simply asking questions and to think of what other variables should we elicit so that we can do more with the data. Uh, what we're trying to do, for instance, now among conference interpreters is replicating the study by Bühler, and it looks like this. And you will see, okay, different layout, but essentially we're asking the same question. It's right, we're asking the same question because we want to replicate. If we ask completely different questions, we cannot compare our findings to Bühler. But uh, if you look at this, this, oh, sorry. No, I don't want you to update. Uh, if you look at the, this is part B of the questionnaire. The interesting part is part A, and it has lots of demographic variables that we think uh, should be known, should be established in order to judge whether the attitude of interpreters has to do with their age, gender, the region that they work in, their language combination, and so on and so forth. Or else we might find that all these potential variables that have an impact on their view of quality criteria don't make a difference. And if we don't find a significant difference, it would mean that the, the habitus of international conference interpreters is very solid, is very coherent, and you don't find a lot of uh, national or sociocultural variation. But we don't know, and in order to establish it, we need the questionnaire, but also all the background variables. So this is one example of how we're trying to, to do the same thing, but to use better methods, and we've used uh, online surveying to, to reach more people than 40 AIC interpreters that, that were possible uh, in the 1980s. Uh, so further findings are needed, and one issue also that comes up is once we have these further findings, what is the impact? What is uh, the significance of what we managed to establish with better methods, perhaps? Uh, I've mentioned this just go through that Rep replication is needed. This is a repetition of what I've been saying. Rep replication is needed because one individual study just doesn't give us enough claim or right to claim that this is what we found and you should change your ways. We need more replication. One good example was done in Granada by Angela Collados Ice, who did this interesting work about the role of intonation once, but she did it a second time in order to see is it really solid enough, this kind of finding. Uh, the, uh, Miriam's work has been replicated in Japan by Mizuno and for instance this study on the role of, of interpretational intonation, uh, the impact of this unique uh, or slightly degraded intonation pattern on comprehensibility, that's been there since 1994 
and hasn't really been taken up and studied further, to my knowledge. So that's another example of that the problem that has been there. Uh, we need to revisit it. We need probably better methods, bigger samples, uh, but we need to work on the same problems that have been out there. We just haven't had, I don't know, the time or interest to study them.